Well, welcome all. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you have not yet, can you put your school name in the chat? Um, if you're in a classroom, the number of students you have with you and what grades they are in. Uh, we use this for data tracking. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce you to Carrie Van Meter from All Purpose Accounting. She's happy to speak with you today. Um, I'll let Carrie take it on over from here. And thank you, Carrie, for um, speaking with students today. Absolutely. Welcome. Hi. Um, well, my, my name is Carrie Van Meter. I own All Access Accounting. Um, and we are honored to um, show interest in anybody that wants to be an accountant of any form or fashion. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen over here. My name is uh, Carrie Van Meter. I own All Access Accounting. My firm is uh, a little over three years old. Um, I'm going to pop forward. That's my kind of an intro of myself. I've been an accountant for 28 years. Chief Financial Officer over oil, fuel, robotics, construction, multiple industries. But I've also been a coach, a success coach for the last 15 years, where I work a lot with a, with a simple word called empowerment. Now, um, I've, I've, I, I like everybody who is an accountant is in four different categories. Uh, you're either a people person or you're not. Most accountants are very stiff and rigid. Uh, some actually have a personality, i.e. myself. Um, but we're going to go through accounting, the different roles, the different ways to look at math. Everybody tends to go through your curriculum and your, your prerequisites and says math and thinks, rolls their eyes. I'm gonna, never going to need that again. But... If math is a is a strength of yours, I would honestly ask you to look inside and ask yourself a few different questions because you could be an accountant that's different than the rest. And that's what I would define myself as. I started my career in human resources, um, employer, employee relations. But as I began to ask employees in this manufacturing field, if you increased your efficiency, what would that impact to the bottom line? Or if you cut these costs, how would that benefit the bottom line? So that when you sat with your employee review, you saved the company 10,000, you could easily say, I want half of that, the savings that I've made to the company. And nobody could answer that question for me, all the way up to the general manager could not tell me how a business is ran better and how that impacts the bottom line. So I went back to college, to night school, to learn accounting principles, uh, GAP per se. And, and today I'm what you would call an operational accountant. So my firm does bookkeeping, accounting, payroll, sales tax. We do everything but tax. I have no interest in doing taxes. Um, but I'm, I'm also, I do trainings twice a month. I'm all about seeing the benefits of accounting. What does that mean? Do you want to count? Some people don't want to deal with people. They want to sit at a desk and they want to find every penny. Or do you want to report? Do you just basically want to sit behind a software, let the software do the work and send out reports and not understand what they mean to the business? Or do you want to interpret? Interpreting means um, investing in the 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 bottom side of accounting to say what I would like to reference is the human capital to businesses, which is which are the doer bees, right? Some of us want to be uh, roofers or you want to be computer programmers or you want to be influencers online. Either way, does it go to a profit and loss or does it go to a balance sheet? Everybody needs to know that difference. If you're going to run a business or if you're going to be any type of of an accountant to have that spark hit to find that passion in the industry. I find it fun, but that's, I'm a Gemini. And so I get bored super easy. So in my industry, I've got five full-time employees and there is not one single day that is the exact same day. When I was a chief financial officer for a multi-million dollar robotics firm, every day I did the same thing. Every month I did the same thing. I was super bored. I made a ton of money, but I was super bored. And I would rather have fun at my job than 
but I'm 53 years old and I've learned my lessons that it's not all about the paycheck. So, but everybody has their own desire, but primarily in accounting, there's two different facets. There's managerial accounting and then there's financial accounting. Uh, and this kind of breaks down a little bit more. It goes back to, do I want to, am I the kind of person that sits behind a desk and wants to find every penny? Or am I the kind of person that wants to sit behind the desk, read the reports, and then go tell management or the operational people of a business, what do these numbers mean? And how can we make our business more liquid, more uh, profitable? Typically, when I, in my professional um, history, I've been able to save companies eight to 20% in cash flow and increase their cash just because the numbers speak to me. I'm different. I, I got probably B's and C's in my math classes, but in the financial side, when I went to college for, for the finance side, I was a 4.0 straight A college student because that fed me, that sparked something in me that I was able to relate to and I've been able to grow upon as the years have come by. Uh, managerial accounting is basically your uh, budget analysis, your cost accountants, your CPAs, the ones that want to actually audit. I can't even imagine being an auditor, but some people enjoy that because they enjoy finding a rule with the IRS and then holding a business accountable to it. Um, the finance, financial side of accounting is taking those numbers and helping a business to run better. It doesn't take eight years of college to be a financial accountant. It just takes your bachelor's degree. And in some situations, just an associate's degree. Um, it's all about what you have behind because if you want to be a financial accountant, I strongly recommend that you veer your education to a general management class as well, so that you would understand how management and accounting connect and talk to each other. Um, that really strengthens your ability to empower, connect those dots between the two. Um, some people most do choose to be CPAs, which are certified public accountants. Um, I choose not to, more so because it restricts what I can and cannot tell my clients that to do with their finances and their accounting. Um, and I don't want four weeks of continuing education that I have to do every year just to be able to keep that accreditation. But if you're an introvert, you love numbers and you love finding those pennies, then I would strongly recommend that CPA be the direction to go. The hardest part of that is just learning your code it's just like a lawyer degree, learning the, the law books to get to pass the bar. You just have to learn GAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles and understand what those are. And then past that point, a CPA license would be very easy to obtain. Um, you So there is when I, earlier when I had mentioned introvert, extrovert, it, it is very much associated with these two categories. A managerial accountant is an internal, it's an introvert. It's somebody that says, I want to go in, I want to clock in, I just want to do my job. I don't want anybody to mess with me. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to do eat my lunch and go home at the end of the day. An external or an extrovert very much works very well with the financial accountant, the operational accountant, because then they can communicate or they can Camille to whoever they're working for or whoever they're working with and to be able to interpret what the accounting, the balance sheet, the profit and loss means. Um, if, if you're an extrovert and you like numbers, I would strongly recommend that you really do some uh, education towards the financial accounting. Um, it's a simple way, and then maybe other things spark. But I believe there's four different kinds of accountants. Uh, most people think we're all just bored and boring, but that's not all this altogether the same. Did I hear a question? No? What happens if they have questions? Um, they can either unmute or they can add it to the chat. Okay. Well, I have my screen shared so I cannot see the chats. So if you'll I just- will, um, What? Yes, oh, 
I'll monitor it for you and I will unmute and let you know. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yep. Great. All right. Um, if I need to slow down, I can, if I want to, whatever that, just let me know how we're going. If I, if I, uh, what I'm saying doesn't make sense, please stop me so I can elaborate. I've never done a, a class like this before. I have made calls to principals, to superintendents, to every middle school, high school, and junior high to try to say, let's put a program like this involved because kids don't graduate high school knowing how to reconcile their bank account. And they need to know. They need to understand money management and compound interest and simple verbiage like that. And I really want to offer to go in and talk to students and help them to understand what is what does accounting mean? And even your own cash. What is a checkbook? What is a credit card? How do I stay out of debt? That kind of thing. So uh, I'm new. This is my very first one. So I'm new to this as far as the education component. Um, so moving on to accounting versus financial management. Uh, for me, everybody has their own why. My why is to be of service. My kids are grown, they're 32 and they're 27. So it's just me. My, my why is for service, to be of service to the small and the medium-sized business owners in the Southern Colorado area, but everybody has their own why. So I would strongly recommend you'd find out what is your why? What do you want to be when you grow up is another way to, to reference. Uh, people say that a lot. Nobody really knows what it means even at 50 years old. Um, but I would strongly recommend three things. The first is to listen. Um, never think that you know what somebody's going to say. Uh, always be open to input, even if it's something you don't agree with. Uh, my grandfather taught me there were three things to never talk about in public, and that's politics, religion, and abortion, because they're lose-lose. Everybody has their own opinion. Um, and I, I think like marijuana should be a fourth one, but that's a different conversation. But I have learned a lot by listening to people I don't agree with, to different aspects. And by surrounding myself around people that know more than me, I've learned a substantial amount that I'd never be able to learn in a classroom or in a book. So first is listen. Second is learn. Find those things that uh, that connect to you, almost like static uh, or dog hair. If it just if it sticks to you and it interests you, really circle around that and learn more about that because that's where passion is driven. That's where passion comes from. And as students or as young individuals, um, you know, the minute you hit adulthood and the minute you hit to be on your own, it's on your own. And that's what you're gonna do for the rest of your life is work. You're gonna work to pay your bills and you're gonna pay your bills in hopes to find time to make a vacation. And then you're gonna look up and it's gonna be time to retire. So the key is, since you're at work more than you're at home, find something that you're truly passionate about. And if accounting is that, knock on a couple doors of, of accountants in the areas, talk to them, find out what they do, why they do it, and find a section in, the, in this industry, which is recession proof, to see what might spark your belly, what sparks the fire in your heart, and really drive upon that. Uh, the third is empowerment. I think that is the most important word in our English language next to hope. Hope and empowerment are very strong, but empowering yourself to, to never have obstacles to get to that why. And when it comes to empowerment with accounting, uh, it will open up a whole broad base full of, of opportunities for you. Um, when I say how to impact the bottom line, um, most people probably don't know what that means. What that means is um, the, the basic profit that a business, that a small, medium-sized, or large business would make, because that is where, if anybody watches Shark Tank, that bottom line is where the driving factor is if your company is profitable, if you can sell it, if it's liquid, is it generating cash? Um, your bottom line is what drives your business. Uh, is efficiency increased or decreased or those are the questions I was talking about earlier is asking questions about how what is it involved with um 
with de increasing efficiency and increasing profit. One of the questions that I had asked in that manufacturing company was, is if your 150 manufacturing employees increase their efficiency, how would that impact your profit and loss? And nobody could answer that. And it was super important because when I walked around and told and and educated um, your your doer bees, your basic people on the line, your basic uh, grunt workers, as they would say, on how to increase their efficiency, which increased the bottom line to that business. They were educated, and by being educated, it the, our human nature it empowers us to do better now that we know why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing what to do so that it not only benefits our pocket, but it benefits the company that most people give their heart to. They, they dedicate their time and they dedicate their heart to the, to the business that they've committed to, to be employed with. Um, for me in Nebraska at the time when I was working for this robotics company, um, the, in, in the Midwest, when the recession hit and when hard times would hit and businesses were losing money, the first thing they would do would they would lay people off. When you lose your employees, that is that human capital that we're talking about. People are more than just to come and to go, and they should be to employees, to employers. But I was able to educate this robotics company how to decrease their safety which is decrease their insurance costs and decrease their other costs so that they didn't have to lay their people off, but they had even a stronger um, reduction of costs to increase their profit and not even have to worry about laying people off. So it's all about how you look at accounting and where you look at it. It's not just, oh, we're losing money, let's fire everybody. Oh, we're losing money. Let's look at how we can trim internal costs so that we hold on to the people that are committed to our business, to our, to our mission as a, as a company. Um, the feedback driven of how to do work better. We're human and we want to do better. We don't want to do a sloppy job. Uh, most, you know, I would say eight out of 10, you always have those few that are, that just don't really care. But when you commit yourself to any job, whether you want to be a roofer or a, an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or uh, an influencer online, right? You want to do it to the best of your ability. Well, if you don't know what you're doing and how it's going to benefit you financially, you, you tend to clump along. But when you know more of how to do things better that increase cash flow and then increase profitability, you instinctively become empowered. You instinctively become driven to go after it and to achieve better. And I don't care where you are in the world, accounting is critical. Even when we had the pandemic, we were accounting, accountants were a, uh, an essential business, but uh, most of our, most of my clients did better during the pandemic because we immediately engaged with our clients. We told them how they could pivot their business models so that they could continue to make money and not feel the loss of the government shutdowns like they did. So um, whatever you're doing in the world, you're always going to need money. You're always going to need an accountant and um even though it doesn't sound like a fun job, I can bring all five of my employees in right now and they would they would tell you they enjoy every single day. It's a blast. But each of them carry 20 to 30 different clients. We don't do the same thing for the same people. So our industry is different. Uh, the unhealthiest statement ever made in life or in business is it's always been done that way. That is never something that you should ever get a, uh, get accustomed to. And even though, you know, whether it's school or life or work or, or, you know, even your hobbies, just because it's been done that way doesn't mean it can't be done a different way, better. Uh, it, it's all about how you look at it. But if anybody comes in and, and tells me, well, it's always been done that way, I would always challenge them there's a better way to do that. 
Um, so going about 20,000 more feet up above, uh, we are humans. And some of us, we all have different personalities, different traits, different strengths, different weaknesses. Some of us are really good with change. Some of us are really bad with change. Um, I call it a resistance to change factor. It's a specific, it's actually a math formula that it is equated to the environments that you go to. Um, but if you are in an environment, if you go to work for somebody in an environment that has a very high resistance to change, and you ask the question, why has it always been done that way? You're going to get resistance because those people that don't ever want to change are never willing to do it, to do things new or different or unique or innovative. But if you are familiar with and keep yourself surrounded in a place of people that are comfortable with change, change is good. Change is hard. Change is difficult. But change is what makes uh, every environment good, every uh, relationships and, um, you know, your homes. And um, as a female, you know, I'm very strong in my faith. And I know that if it's not without God, that I would have my business or where I'd be where I'm at in my life right now. But if I feel out of control in my life, I rearrange a room in my home. Because it's the one thing I, I know that I can change. But I'm surrounded by a, a diversification of people that don't like change. So be always be cognizant of whatever classroom you go into or business that you go into or industry, the people that you're going to work for, unless you want to be an entrepreneur, those people have everything to do with your growth and your empowerment. So be cognizant. Am I surrounded by people that don't like change? And then know your audience. Because if those people don't like change, you're going to be stuck to do exactly what you're told to do, to do exactly the way it's always been done. And to me, that's not fun. Other people may enjoy that. To me, it would be very stagnant and I would I would want to die. Not literally die, but you know my, my point. I would not enjoy my days. Um, to me, the numbers speak. Math, math is boring. Algebra is boring. Geometry is boring, all, you know, calculus, all that stuff is boring, but it serves a purpose. And that purpose is to understand where do I get a number from? And whether that's calculating PT pay time off, calculating overtime wages, calculating gross profit or gross margin, all of those classes that you go into um, are going to be a funnel to your overall uh, strength as an accountant of who you may or may not be in the world. So for me, when I look at a set of financials, they talk like the numbers literally point out, I can find the errors that fast. And I think that's just a talent that God gave me. Um, but the numbers speak, I don't like to do data entry. I don't like to do bookkeeping. I, I, I whine every moment that I do it, but I hire people that do. My ladies enjoy the data entry and the bookkeeping and the reconciliation that feeds them. It doesn't feed me. I'm very cognizant on those languages and my part of accounting. So if you're going into that industry, uh, dissect what do numbers mean to you? Do you interpret them different than normal or are you going to be a financial or an accountant? Um, the other thing that I would recommend if you are thinking about being an accountant of any form or fashion is, is a book. And if you're a reader, I've always said readers are leaders. Um, but if you, if you ever get in the moment of thinking, there's a book called Group Think Theory. And you can probably see them in your social circles right now at school. Uh, there's always the group of people. There's always the strong person in the group that says, we're doing this and we're not doing that. And if you'll notice other followers, there's always a leader in a group and then there's followers, but those followers always go, okay, we'll go with her or him, right? The group think theory happens more in business. You have what we, I call a yes man or woman in today's society. I don't know, a yes, a yes person. And that, and those, so I be cognizant of those group think environments where are you going to be a yes person or are you going to be your own person 
Um, I was never warned about those going into the business industry, and I wished I would have, because um, being around uh, yes people really limits your ability to grow and to nurture who you want to be in your profession. Um, but I would empower your the human motivation side of you. Um, is this healthy? Is this happy? It's no different than in a relationship, in your work relationship. Is there, you know, is it, is this toxic? Is this healthy? Is this happy? Uh, make sure that if you're going to go into any occupation, that those um, external influencers are, are healthy for you, for sure. Um, if you're, a, if you are a reader, a few books that I would recommend strongly, Think and Grow Rich. That book is might seem like it's like, hey, go out and make a million dollars. It's not. It's Think and Grow Rich, meaning rich in self, rich in life, rich in um, your why. Uh, it's a very good book as far as feeding who you want to be. Uh, who Moved My Cheese? It's about that thick. It's super easy to read, but it's very intellectual as far as people getting involved with who you are and and your work environment and the one minute manager this means um the one minute manager again it's a super small book i am not a micromanager my girls um for me it is critical that i create a work environment where they get to go to work not that they have to go to work i want them excited to come here every day um that that empowers them to be a part of our overall growth uh, but um, they know I'm not a, a micromanager. I'm not all up in their, you know, business. Like, did you get this done? Did you do that? Did you do that? We all have that, or we've had it. And if, if you haven't had a job yet, you will have that where you'll have that manager that just has their foot on your neck at all times. This one minute manager book is an easy, really good um, read in that it tells you who you need to be led by. And that is important because Whatever you choose to do profession-wise, you need to make sure that you are provided with a good leader, not a boss, not somebody with a bullwhip telling you how to go and do, but a good leader that showed that helps you grow, that watches you, that listens to your input and your feedback. And a part of that comes back to that resistance to change, somebody that is willing to give you the tools that allow you the growth. Um, and then time management, I am a huge procrastinator, huge. And I know I do my best work at the last minute. I can't do that as a as self-employed because I have examples to set for them. Um, but half the reason why I open my own business is I'm not a morning person and I don't want to go to work at 8, 8 a.m. for somebody else. So I work for myself and I come to work at 10. <laughs> they come in at 8.30 and I come in at 10. My hours are 10 to 7. But I have to really strengthen my time management that I get the things done that I want to in that time um, with good, here's my goals, here's what I'm doing, um, here's where I want to be. That goes back to a vision board, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but performance improvements, wage increases, and cost decreases. Um, I, I think generationally, as we all know, our generations have changed in my day. We were grateful to get a job. We were grateful to get a wage. Um, and when we got a raise, it was not very much, but we were expected to be very grateful. This generation has a different perspective of work values and ethics. And it's more of a, um, if I were to offer a job, people more look at me like um, they, they are almost expected of a higher wage. And then they'll in turn give me the performance based on the wage that I pay them. So it, the, the, the generations have changed. Uh, if you're going into a profession because you want to make six figures a year, um, then dissect which, which industry you want to go. And if you want to be an accountant, um, I would strongly recommend that you dissect that through because if you want six figures a year, you need to be a CPA. And to be a CPA, you're going to need eight years of college. That means student loan debt, right? So all of those things, uh, no matter what you want to be, have a consequence to them. And you just want to make sure that you've worked 
your wage increase, your cost of living, your, you know, entertainment, your plays and those types of things to make sure that you're profiting both in time and in your, in your bank account, in your, in your wage pocket. Um, the way to get started is to quit talking and to begin doing. I think it goes back to, I'm not sure, what are the ages of the audience that I have? Uh, high school students, so most likely 15 and up. Okay. Um, I mean, they're a broad base of, uh, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, I don't really want to grow up. I don't, uh, you know, when I'm going to go to college, I'm uh, not going to go to college. I'm going to do a trade school. I'm going to do an online. I I, um, I think it's all over the the board and that's okay for whoever you are. Um, as I said earlier, I have two boys. They're 32 and 27. Uh, I missed a year because they just turned in January. Um, and I had three rules for my boys. And that was the, uh, your first vehicle will be a clutch because I'm not going to race a Nancy that can't drive a, a stick. Um, the, the second was about their grades, A's, B's. The third was you will go to college. I did my college, I was a mom at early age. I was 20 when I had my first child. Um, so I had to do all of my college at nights while raising a, a child and going to work and paying the bills. And um, that was harder. And I knew that their generation was going to require that piece of paper, that college degree. Uh, and it would be difficult for them to even make ends meet without that. So I, I mandated that they would go to college. Now, my first one, uh, my first child is, is he wrestled his through his whole years and he didn't want to wrestle in college. And I went and got a wrestling scholarship and I went and signed him up for college. And I went and got, I basically put him in college and he didn't even want to go. And I didn't listen to him because I was just trying to be that mom doing the right thing for him. And he it took him five years. He drank his first couple of years, but after the third year, he got engaged and he got involved, but it took him five years and he finally did graduate. Um, and I'm glad he did. And I think he's glad he did too, but um, he isn't, his degree doesn't have anything to do with what he's doing today. He's managing a trucking company. So uh, whatever choice you make to be, uh, I feel you have, and uh, society gives you from 19 to 24 uh, to figure out who you want to be. And and because it's after 24 on, it's a little harder to figure out to go into college or just, you know, live in a dorm or to, so I would, I would encourage you to think about, is it college? And if it is, what is it going to be? So that, that debt, that college debt that you're going to get, you're putting it to work. If you don't want to go to college, you want to go to a trade school. If you're thinking about being an accountant, um, you can do that at a basic level. You can go get a part-time job now at an accounting firm. Uh, you would learn the most because you'd be able to learn the core curriculum of what it means to be a bookkeeper, meaning what is a profit and loss? What is a balance sheet? Uh, what does income mean? What does expenses mean? Uh, the basic uh, nomenclature or or language that, that accountants would have. And then if you find yourself with a good firm, then they typically have tuition reimbursement. So if you've got a good firm, they will pay for your education or they'll pay for half of it with your grades being good. And then you basically have a company willing to invest in you. And then you're working for a company that you're able to put that work back to work for, if that makes any sense at all. Um, but you're also able to see if you work part-time for an accounting firm, is that anything you even want to do? Um, again, it has to do with the factor of who they are, because if I can assure you that my girls enjoy what they do, but partly because um, I allow them to do that because I'm not some huge roaring ogre, right? If I was a difficult boss or a leader, it would make their job worse. So make sure that you're working for good people, ones that are available to change, ones that are ready to invest in you. Um, I would strongly recommend accounting because 
even if the banking system crashed tomorrow, our industry isn't going to go away. Other industries might, right? But our industry is not going to go away. Um, this is my team. And I know I said I had five full time. I have uh, a new one that I don't have a picture up there with. But Rachel's been with me the longest, two and a half years. Lori's been a year and a half. Anna's been with me for about six months. Um, then there's myself. And then there's Allison out in the front. Her picture is not up there yet. Um, timeline to success. Know your target. Where, what am I going after? Um, and I know it doesn't feel like adulthood is is creeping on you, but it is at the age of 18. Know your passion. Don't, uh, I wouldn't, man, I wouldn't waste your, your primitive 19 to 30 years in, in anything that you don't enjoy. I would not, because you only get one life. You only get this one time around. So I would certainly try to find something that you're passionate about. Uh, know your audience. Again, know the people you're going to work with know the people you're going to work for, know the people you're going to work alongside um, because they have a, everything to do with where you want to be when you grow up. Uh, every work environment has that one Karen who's super toxic and super, you know, Karen, which is this generation's way of saying, you know, a difficult person, but you always got that one, but make sure when you, when you interview, that you interview the team that you're going to be working with as well. Not just the people you're going to work for, but ask to meet the team. When I interview for, for this firm, um, but the first interview is with me and the second interview is with the team without me in the room. So they can ask, who am I? How, what is it like to work with me, for me? What's it like to work here? Um, that's super important because environment has everything to do with, with you enjoying the ride. Um, step four, vision board your life vision board your objectives. And I say that, you know, again, I'm a Christian. I'm not about any other, you know, but there is some things to be said for writing it down because our human nature is if we write it down as a goal, we will work towards those goals and we will make those things very important for us. Um, and then build the metrics of what that looks like for you to, for you to succeed. Is it college? Is it working part-time? Is it shadowing? But, you know, we have been called so many words, comptroller, controller, bean counter, um, but we are the backbone. Accountants are the backbone of every business, every business. And it is a great career with a good security and pay. You just got to make sure you put yourself in the right door. There's accounting, creative accounting, stunt accounting. And I thought this cartoon was a little funny because um, creative accounting would be those, those ones that uh, sit behind a desk and, and try to re, uh, recategorize what standard expenses would be. CPAs are ones that, that see no gray. They are black, white. That isn't, that is deductible, that is not. Creative accountants are ones that are more in the gray and stunt accounting would be uh, more of like what we do. I mean, in any given day, we do eight to 10 different industries, financials in one day. So that's kind of a, there's no slow roll to our pace. Um, accountants make up the backbone of every business. Uh, oh, I duplicated that. They're vital to the organization and make sure that money, which is cash, cash flow keeps rolling in the doors and all the bills get paid because, you know, utilities, expenses, all that stuff adds up. It's important that you should know what all that means. Now, going back to the whole introvert, extrovert. Now, the picture I found cute, again, if you'll notice, much like a copier, the black ink is empty and the red ink is full, meaning when you have a profit and loss that has red ink, there are losses. Means you're in the red, means you're losing money. So this is an indicator that this accounting department is running well because it's very profitable. I got a kick out of it anyway. Uh, but the introvert enjoys the thrills of researching to the penny. An extrovert still can enjoy that, that thrill too, but the introvert wants to be left alone, independent, uh, very typically very nerdish. Um, uh, and speaks a different language that most people don't understand, enjoys gap rules. Uh, I mean, I enjoy gap rules too, but not, they they live their life based on those rules. Very, very 
uh, very rigid. Um, the vast array of business industries to the rules, and they're more desk people. They're more uh, clock in, sit in your cubicle, do your job, clock out. They're just, they don't want to be, they don't like people. Uh, extroverts are people like myself. We can read the bigger picture of the number of operations and we can communicate that to anybody. I have, uh, I do trainings twice a month. And every time that training room is filled, it's filled with different people, different personalities, different languages. Some need to see it, some need to hear it. And it's a matter of understanding your audience and how you can decipher what any of those financials mean. Um, and then, you know, wants to learn more about the multiple different industries and the spectrum of GAP. Um, again, we have diversification. I have employed a couple accountants that have 20 years experience of accounting, but they can't do what we do. What we do has a unique ability to be able to pivot, to pivot from a roofer to uh, construction, to um, restaurants, back to construction, back to manufacturing. We pivot to all different industries in any given day. Um, and that's fun. That is enjoyable. And your typical introvert accountants can't do that. They have to have a system. I'm going to do payables today. I'm going to do receivables tomorrow. I'm going to print checks the next day. I'm going to read the financials. So they're very same thing over and over again. And you, if you want to do accounting, got to figure out which side of those aisles would you be? And then go shadow. I would go find a company um, and ask them. I would really like to be like you. Can I shadow? Can I just sit with you for a couple days a week and just watch what it's like to do your job? Um, oh, that didn't come over. That's the summary of that. That didn't come over. Um, so that's kind of the last part of the presentation. It's, uh, this was, I was building this based a lot on dialogue back and forth to and from if people had questions or what ifs or scenarios to be able to ask. So I'm gonna open it up for questions or truly the question is, is there anybody in the rooms listening that wants to be an accountant? All right, well, um, and you guys are all local, right? You're Southern, are you Pueblo? All these schools are Pueblo? Um, the school that's online right now is from Pueblo, yes. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, open up my door and say, reach out to me if you are interested um, and you're free to come in and shadow for a day or two to see exactly what I mean behind the, the different examples of the presentation that we're talking about. Um, I would love to be able to feed more minds of, of how cool accounting is because it's pretty cool. Great. Thank you, Carrie, for uh, presenting to us today and teaching the students all about accounting and the ins and outs and um, what they should do and how they should get there. We're very grateful for you. And thank you, students, for participating and being here um, and joining us. Uh, I'll be in contact with about our next remote guest speaker and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Absolutely. Let me know if I can help any further.